Welcome to the Water Resources Podcast. I'm your host, Bridget Scanlon, from the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas at Austin. This podcast is produced in partnership with the National Academy of Engineering. In this podcast, we discuss water challenges with leading experts. Hi, everybody. Uh, delighted to have uh, Dr. Lenny Conical on the podcast today. Uh, Lenny is the editor-in-chief of Groundwater Journal and is a, an emeritus scientist at the USGS uh, following a 42-year career as a research hydrologist. Uh, Lenny has received numerous awards from the hydrologic community and was inducted into the National Academy of Engineering in 2015. And the citation was for modeling of coupled groundwater and ground and surface water flow and of solid transport in groundwater. Uh, he's also a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and uh, received the Mindser Award from uh, the Geological Society of America. Um, one of his recent uh, books is titled Groundwater Resource Development, Effects and Sustainability that was published within the Groundwater Project. Um, Lenny, it might be nice if you could give uh, the audience a brief um, review of the topics that you focus on in your research. Okay, I've had a long career in uh, hydrogeology and groundwater research, and the main focus of my work has been the development and application of groundwater flow models and solute transport models, uh, both theoretical, numerical developments, as well as application to field problems. Uh, I've been very interested in, in uh, assessing the predictive accuracy of groundwater models, uh, as well as the so-called validation process, which usually is not valid, uh, usually constitutes false advertising, but that, that's, a, that's a different po podcast. Uh, okay. uh, I've also been interested in, uh, looked at groundwater surface water interactions, long-term groundwater depletion on a national and global scale, as well as the uh, broader issue of groundwater sustainability. And uh, thank you so much, Lady. I really appreciate your taking the time to talk with us today. I think, uh, you know, people are becoming increasingly interested uh, in groundwater as a resource and recognizing the importance of groundwater, um, you know, as we are subjected to intense droughts, uh, surface water uh, depletion, and uh, groundwater can provide a buffer uh, against uh, the surface water resource um, um, issues. Um, you have conducted um, a lot of work collating data across the US for many different aquifers, um, quantifying uh, depletion and also areas where groundwater resources have been increasing over the past century. Maybe you can yeah. describe a little bit uh, about that work. Sure, be happy to. Uh, and, and thanks for inviting me to participate in this. Uh, you know, basically, you know, the overview is that groundwater represents a huge reserve or reservoir of fresh water in the United States and globally, and it's present to some degree almost everywhere. Uh, it's certainly the largest stock of liquid fresh water on the planet. So groundwater really has a great potential for assisting in the adaptation to climate extremes and climate change. As traditional surface water resources become scarcer uh, and more strained, locally available groundwater resources may offer an alternative source, uh, especially for domestic use, uh, as well as an alternative storage reservoir uh, for periods when there's excess water. Uh, if groundwater development and use is going to increase, we really should do careful planning uh, to provide optimal management of the resource, as well as uh, it will require uh, detailed hydrogeologic assessments to uh, find out where the groundwater could be developed with the least uh, costs uh, and environmental consequences. And the consequences are a, a, a major issue. Pumping groundwater out of a well has consequences 
uh, and these need to be evaluated as a trade-off or a cost in the overall water supply picture. We want to minimize uh, environmental co consequences uh, and really try to assure that the groundwater use can is sustainable uh, and can be relied on to provide water security uh, for an indefinite period into the future. Uh, keeping yeah. that in mind, I was just going to add that groundwater is not a limitless resource, uh, but it's always a valuable resource. In some places, groundwater really behaves as a renewable resource and sustainability of development can be more easily achieved. But in other places, it's more of a non-renewable resource uh, and development of groundwater is essentially mining the groundwater. It's, it's not renewable. In the extreme cases, we could call this fossil groundwater. Uh, anywhere that an aquifer is overexploited or overdeveloped, the consequences will eventually come back to haunt us. And this can be in the form of depletion of surface water resources, drying out of springs, uh, dry wells, uh, the increased cost of pumping, uh, or the increased cost of drilling deeper wells uh, to replace the ones that have dried out. Right. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, it's really nice that you collected the data and you summarized data, which was a huge effort. Uh, the, the USGS had all these regional models of major aquifers in the US uh, from many from beginning in the 1900s. And I guess when they originally developed some of these aquifers, they did think that it was a limitless resource. I mean, for example, yep. in California, drilling wells, uh, they were artesian, they flowed at the surface, uh, they thought they would never um, run out. So, but uh, over time, then we began to realize that it's not a limitless resource and we need to manage it better. So we're fortunate in the US that the US Geological Survey and various state agencies have invested a lot in developing regional models and monitoring networks to evaluate the, the fate of groundwater and the evolution of these groundwater systems. Maybe you can describe the results of some of those modeling and monitoring analysis for the different aquifers in the US and how they compare with each other. Right, uh, be happy to do that. Uh... About 40 years or so ago, maybe a little longer, the USGS started a program called the uh, RASA program, which is a regional aquifer system analysis program. And we, the survey, uh, started analysis in depth, including simulation model development for almost all of the largest aquifer systems in the US. And th this generated a, a, a wealth of data and improved understanding. Uh, along this time in the late 1980s to you know, 1990 or so, more than 30 years ago, uh, I really began my interest in groundwater depletion and this possible connection to sea level rise. At that time, uh, many people were beginning to be concerned about depletion of groundwater resources, uh, excessive water level declines and water table declines in some areas such as uh, Arizona, uh, the Southern High Plains, Central Valley of California and so on. Uh, and a whole other different circle of scientists, oceanographers were also interested and in, in warning about uh, sea level rise and its possible connection to climate change. There were very few people uh, that I was aware of that were making any connections between the two. And I really was not aware of anyone who had done any studies to integrate all the different uh, groundwater assessments uh, throughout the nation and throughout the world to try to estimate uh, how much total cumulative groundwater depletion was occurring. Uh, so it, I kind of decided to start doing an inventory uh, based largely on published studies and data to assess long-term trends in uh, 
changes in groundwater storage, that is groundwater depletion. Uh, and one of my reasons was to see if cumulatively over a long period of time, uh, these added up to such a large volume of loss of groundwater that it might actually have some impact on or contribution to sea level rise. To the maximum extent possible, I try to base my estimates uh, on direct measurements of water level changes in aquifers and on calibrated simulation models uh, for large aquifer systems where the calibrations of the models are, are typically keyed to observe changes in water levels or heads in uh, as observed in wells. So I wanted to start my study uh, long enough ago that we could really get at long-term trends and anthropogenic effects of uh, groundwater development. What I found, kind of getting back to the bigger picture, the total groundwater depletion in the US from the 20s, well, really what I did is I started with 1900 and went up through 2008, uh, as, as close as I get to the time that I was doing the study. So we're looking at a time period of more than 100 years what I found was that in the US, the total groundwater depletion was approximately a thousand cubic kilometers. That's a lot of water. It's for a, a comparison, it's about twice the volume of water contained in Lake Erie. That's how much groundwater has been lost from the subsurface aquifers in just in the United States. I also looked globally, there were several systems, aquifers, large aquifer systems around the world for which at least some data were available to assess long-term groundwater depletion. And my best estimate on a global picture was that uh, there was about 4,500 cubic kilometers uh, of groundwater depletion during this 108 year uh, study period. And the overall accuracy probably in the US with this better data available was on the order of plus or minus 10 to 15%. And globally was probably closer to plus or minus 20%. And that, that's, that was basically probably uh, about the best we could do. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in the storage properties of aquifers in data on pumpage uh, and, and just all the factors, how representative the observe, few observed water level changes are and so on. So there's definitely uh, uncertainty there. Uh, in the US, the largest volume of depletion occurring in a single aquifer system is in the High Plains aquifer, whereby from 1900 to 2008, total to approximately 340 cubic kilometers. And that's continued to increase, uh, even though we might say, well, that can't possibly continue, but it is continuing and it's continuing at, at a fairly high rate. Uh, by now, by 2020 or more recently, it's probably closer to 400 cubic kilometers just in this one aquifer system. So just this one aquifer system, you could, say uh, is a, the depletions equivalent, almost equivalent to the volume in Lake Erie. Uh, well, the, well, the Lake Erie is a little bigger. Um, other very large depletion volumes, but not quite as large as in the High Plains, uh, occurs in the Central Valley of California, the alluvial basins of uh, Arizona, mostly Central and Southern Arizona, and the Mississippi Embayment Aquifer. Uh, these are large systems and there's large amounts of groundwater use and there's large storage uh, losses uh, in these systems. The High Plains Aquifer, as you know, you've studied it, 
uh, is a very large system, and it's not as, uh, you know, one number doesn't do it justice. Uh, there's a lot of variation. The most severe depletion occurs in the southern and central high plains, uh, Kansas, Oklahoma, and uh, Texas and New Mexico. Uh, and in the northern part, uh, in Nebraska, for example, there's been almost no long-term net change in groundwater storage uh, on average. Uh, in Nebraska, for example, in some areas near the South Platte River, there's actually been a long-term rise in water levels due to uh, diversion of surface water for irrigation, which increases recharge above the natural rate. Uh, in other parts of Nebraska, there is depletion, but on the whole, it's, it's not a significant total change in volume of groundwater in Nebraska. So they, they, yeah. So so Lenny, I mean, in Nebraska, I mean, it's maybe not because they're pumping less or whatever, but they also have uh, the the sand hills and high recharge from the sand hills, and then maybe thirty percent of the irrigation is coming from surface water, which helps to recharge the aquifer. But uh, the uh, soils in the rest of the high plains, the central and southern, are very clay rich, and the recharge is very low. So similar levels of pumpage then depleting the groundwater because I know from our work in the Texas part of the High Plains, they were pumping about 10 times the recharge rate uh, in the southern part of the central High Plains. So it's uh, the soils and the texture and the recharge rates and all of these uh, things that impact the sustainability of uh, the use of groundwater in the High Plains. Absolutely. And... Uh... The present rates of groundwater use in the Southern High Plains clearly is not sustainable. So there will be changes. Uh, these changes can come through conservation efforts, uh, through changes in, in water management and, and policy, or they will be, the changes will happen because mother nature will dictate <laughs> that these changes will happen. So, uh, but clearly, the present rates are, are unsustainable. In the U.S., it's interesting that there are two very large aquifer systems in the northwestern U.S., both of these volcanic rock systems, where there's been a very significant net rise in the water table in the long term. Uh, these increases in groundwater storage in these systems arise principally because uh, in the 20th century, uh, surface water has been diverted for use in irrigated agriculture. And early on, it was applied with a flood irrigation method, although that's been changing to sprinkler irrigation and, and other more conservative methods. But still, what it resulted in was large applications of water two large areas, agricultural areas, which increase the recharge, which cause water tables to rise. So there's a net increase in storage over this long-term period. What we did in looking more detailed at both of these systems, one of the Snake River Plain uh, aquifer system, the other being the Columbia Plateau. Um, in both of these systems, there's been a reversal of the trend in the last couple of decades due to increased groundwater use. And this increase has been substantial. So during the last couple of decades, there's been a net depletion of groundwater in storage in these systems, although not enough to offset the increases that occurred in the 20th century. So comparing today's groundwater in storage with 1900, there's still more groundwater in these aquifers than there was in 1900, but the trend is that it's uh, in a, the, re, the reserves are being slowly depleted. Right. I think, um, you know, uh, surface water irrigation can recharge groundwater. And uh, I think sometimes when people say we need very efficient irrigation systems, and uh, Claudia Font from the USGS in California has said, you know, 
we need inefficient surface water irrigation because it can recharge the groundwater and is not a net loss. And we need very efficient groundwater irrigation systems. And just as you described in the Northwest, the snake in the Columbia, I mean, the thousand springs in the snake uh, plain, you know, was evidence of uh, discharge from the thousand springs increased over time as, as the, the aquifers built up. And I think um, Alan McDonald and his uh, team found similar things happening in the Indo-Gangetic plain when they had the canal irrigation there early on and uh, a net increase of about 350 cubic kilometers. But in right. the last couple of decades declines because of increasing groundwater use. I guess the increasing groundwater uses, as you say, you know, groundwater is pervasive. They can access it anywhere. They can drill a well locally and access groundwater, whereas it takes a lot more management maybe to have a surface water irrigation system. Right. With groundwater, it's available right where you need it. And you control the pumps. And so it's available when you need it. You don't need expensive conveyance structures, pipelines, or canals uh, to get the water to you. So even where the canals exist today from, from prior projects, uh, you know, there's, there's always constraints and, and the canals can only carry so much water. Uh, so there's limitations on what farmers can get. So they, you know, they, they typically need more water or want to irrigate more land. So they'll make the investment in drilling a well, uh, and then they have more water available to irrigate their crops and uh, basically lead to more successful uh, crop yields. I think, um, you know, I think that's really important to this connection between surface water and groundwater. And uh, many people don't recognize that. It's, it's unfortunate that in many areas they're regulated separately or managed separately. And so, but they are one system and we need to recognize that to optimize their use and to try to make it more sustainable. Absolutely. Um, so you mentioned, you know, the, the sea level rise contribution of groundwater depletion. So I think you mentioned that uh, globally there was about 4,500 cubic kilometers of depletion. And right. that, that included the 1,000 cubic kilometers from the U.S. Is that, that included correct? it, yes. So, so, so the U.S. is about a quarter then of the global uh, depletion. And then how much of the sea level rise then would that contribute? Uh, and how has it changed over time? Okay, basically... Uh... You know, the, the question is, can it contribute to <laughs> sea level rise? And that gets to, you know, what happens to all the water that's pumped out of wells? Where does it go? Well, it's applied to the land, it's used for crops, it's used for water supply. Much of it evaporates or transpires from agricultural use. Some of it runs off into streams and rivers. Some of it infiltrates back into the aquifer. But we can look just at the net pumpage uh, and, and not rather total pumpage. Uh, what we believe is that much of this water will travel through the atmosphere if it's evaporated or transpired or travel through river systems. But the ultimate sink for most, most the great majority of the groundwater that's pumped and used ultimately would have to be in the oceans where it can accumulate. Okay, and then it becomes part of the overall hydrocycle, hydrologic cycle. So how much could that 4,500 kilometers contribute? Well, the simple way to estimate that uh, is spread that total volume of groundwater depletion over the surface area of the oceans. Uh, and you find that it would account for a sea level rise of about 13 millimeters. And over the 20th century into the present time, that's something on the order of 10% of the observed sea level rise. Now, if you look at the rate of sea level rise uh, since 1990, uh, the oceanography community believes that the rate of sea level rise has increased 
to something on the order of 3.1 millimeters per year compared to an average rate in the uh, 20th century of about 1.8 millimeters per year. So the rate of sea level rise has increased, but the rate of groundwater depletion during this uh, same time has also increased. And over the last decade or two uh, would be equivalent to about 0 0.4 millimeters per year over the area of the oceans. So just on that basis, groundwater depletion in the recent decades can balance about 13% of the recent sea level rise. So I believe that groundwater depletion is a small but non-trivial uh, contributor to sea level rise. It should be accounted for in the balance uh, of the volumes of water in the ocean. And groundwater depletion really represents a transfer of water from the continents to the oceans and can be viewed that way. Of course, there's a counteracting process in terms of water transfer from continents to oceans. And that's the construction of dams and large reservoirs behind the dams. Uh, during the 20th century, uh, a lot of water was held back from running off into the oceans. But during the latter part of the 20th century, the volume of additional surface water storage uh, on the continents has generally uh, diminished or is stabilized, uh, while the greater rate of groundwater depletion has still been increasing. So its relative importance of, of groundwater uh, uh, wow. It continues uh, to be a, a factor. So, yeah, you know, it's a, I think uh, 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 that's really important uh, to consider. And much of your work, Lady, uh, you emphasize uh, how when you pump water from the ground, uh, the source of that water changes over time. Um, initially, maybe from storage and then other sources. Can you describe that? And I think you describe it really well in your recent book in the groundwater project. Yeah. Um, and the groundwater the, myth, I guess, would be another topic of interest. Yeah, water, water budget myth. Water budget uh, as myth. It was described yes. by uh, John Breederhoff and by uh, others. I've lost you. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so, yeah, I guess we could get at the question, what is the source of water pumped from a well? And this was really described very well by the very famous groundwater hydrologist C.V. Tice in a classic 1940 paper. So all of these principles really have been well-defined for more than 80 years. They're just not <laughs> well recognized by the vast community of hydrologists. Uh, groundwater hydrologists generally do, but it, it's still, even among groundwater scientists, it's sometimes a fuzzy concept. And what, what C.V. Tice pointed out in this paper is that when you pump a well, initially, most of that water comes out of storage in the aquifer. You're depleting the groundwater in storage in the aquifer as water flows into the well due to head declines related to pumping. When you pump water, it lifts water out of the well, the, the water level in the well goes down, you get drawdown. That drawdown spreads into the aquifer and spreads out over time and distance. And this results in changes in hydraulic gradient. The cone of depression that results from this is really reflects the volume of water depleted from that pumping. Over time, that cone of depression spreads and has other consequences. So as the water table declines, groundwater evapotranspiration may decrease because the water table drops below the root zone in some areas. That cone of depression may reach surface water sources. And so uh, it may reduce the discharge of base flow to streams. 
or it may actually reverse hydraulic gradients between the stream and the aquifer and cause induced infiltration. These effects, other than the storage depletion as a whole, can be called capture because it reflects the fact that the well is pumping water that otherwise would have gone elsewhere. It's capturing that water that would have flowed to streams or discharged to lakes, to wetlands, or springs. be consumed by plants or springs or submarine groundwater discharge to in coastal areas. So all of these really reflect capture. So the basic principle elucidated by C.V. Tice in his 1940 paper is that groundwater is balanced by a combination of storage depletion and capture. Over time, initially, storage depletion is the primary factor or source of water to wells. And over time, that balance between capture and storage depletion shifts so that over time, capture, as the Kona depression spreads out through the aquifer, capture becomes a larger and larger fraction uh, of the water derived by pumping a well. Ultimately, it, the, you know, the, the rate of storage depletion will ultimately or could ultimately stabilize. And at that point, there's no additional depletion of storage. Water levels do not continue to drop. And all of the pumpage from the well is balanced by capture. Okay. If that happens, and it doesn't happen in all systems, can't happen everywhere, but when that does happen, the rate of pumpage can continue indefinitely in time. And from strictly a hydraulic perspective, that pumping is sustainable. Okay. As long as, it's, as long as it's not negatively impacting the surface water too much, maybe. Well, yeah. that, you know, how much is too much? It will impact surface water. That is, it, we cannot use strictly a hydraulic definition for sustainability because that ignores the consequences on surface water and on streams. Right. So uh, determining sustainability of groundwater really requires uh, some subjective judgment calls, okay? Because you have to incorporate an assessment of these environmental consequences of pumpage uh, in deciding what a sustainable level is or should be. And it may be quite a bit less than what you could physically continue to pump out of a well. And the effects can include land subsidence, wells going dry, springs drying up, surface water being diminished, and so on. Uh, so this then gets into the broader issue of how do you trade off all of these consequences against the need for water security? You know, right. where do you... Where, where do you draw the line and who draws the line? And this, this is a, a, this right. is a com complicated issue. And inevitably, uh, we'll bring in policymakers, legislators, and lawyers. And right. you know, this, this can get very messy and involve litigation. And we've certainly seen cases where uh, one state has sued another state because they believe they're not getting their fair share of surface water because the upstream state uh, is capturing the... Is, the yeah. There's a lot of groundwater usage which is affecting surface water and depleting the stream flow before it gets across the state line. And in general, uh, in, you know, interstate cases go directly to the U.S. Supreme Court. In general, the 
courts, including the Supreme Court, has recognized the fact that pumping groundwater can indeed diminish or deplete surface water resources. So that, uh, that, that legal basis has been established. Um, so I guess you're, you're referring to uh, Kansas and uh, Colorado, right? Uh, that's that's one, one of, of the cases. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one, there are other cases, but uh, in, in that case, again, it's a complicated case and I'm not aware of all the issues, but the basic outcome is that uh, Kansas won the case for the most part, and uh, Colorado had to make better efforts to uh, meet their obligations of surface water flows to the uh, state line, what goes into Kansas, and that involved you know, some controls, management, and limitations on groundwater use uh, in the Arkansas River Valley of Colorado, and uh, you know, that makes some people unhappy, you know, that's a <laughs> concern, <clears throat> you know, and uh, what, you know, right, that, yeah, without doing anything, then downstream users were unhappy <laughs> and concerned. So there's, there's no way to make everybody happy, and you have to find some way uh, to balance all the complexities. So I, yeah, I have a couple of questions that I'd like to ask uh, related to yeah. this interaction between groundwater and surface water. So to summarize, you know, what you said with groundwater development, before you put in any wells, uh, the recharge to the aquifer discharges to surface water bodies, springs, lakes, uh, rivers as base flow. And then when you put in the, uh, well, then initially it takes it from aquifer storage and then uh, the cone of depression then expands and, and captures it from other sources. Yeah. Um, one, of the, yeah, one of the things that Tice pointed out in his paper, or you could gather from reading it, is that when you look at the balance between well pumpage, storage depletion, and capture, what you realize in, in what Tice pointed out the natural recharge to the system does not enter into the equation. It does not enter into the balance. In a certain sense, it's all, the, the recharge is almost irrelevant. And I, I wouldn't say it's irrelevant, but in terms of the effects of pumping the well and limits on uh, you know, the pumping of the well and the what balances the well, recharge does not enter into it because of what you were just getting at. There is natural recharge and there's natural discharge before the well is drilled. When you start pumping, you disturb the balance between natural recharge and natural discharge. And it's made up by either, by some combination of a depletion of the amount in storage, an increase in recharge or a, and or a decrease in discharge. So it's really those two factors the increase and decrease, uh, increase in recharge, decrease in discharge that constitute capture and really have to be evaluated. Okay. And yeah. the, act the actual amount of recharge should not be considered a as a primary factor in assessing the uh, limits or sustainability of groundwater development. And so that's what, really that's really the water budget myth <laughs> that Breederhoff and others uh, get into. Right. So when you look at the numbers, then in the U.S., we are very fortunate in that we have data on how much people pump, uh, or estimates right. of how much people pump, and then we also right. have estimates of how much groundwater depletion occurs. So when you look at the U.S. as a whole, and you look at all the studies that you evaluated. How much is uh, groundwater depletion relative to uh, capture, and how much they pump? Okay, that's that's certainly an interesting question, and you know, to assess that, we really have to have some good idea of how much is being pumped. Uh, fortunately, the the U.S. Geological Survey every year, every five years, excuse me, uh, publishes a, basically a census of water use in the United States, it's updated every five years, and it includes a reasonably good estimate of how much groundwater use occurs uh, in the US on the average during each five year period. And 
the most recent assessment in 2015 indicated that withdrawals of fresh groundwater in the U.S. totaled about 315 million acre feet, which is about 400 cubic kilometers a year. Again, compare that to Lake Erie, that's, that's you know, uh, more than 80% of the volume of water in Lake Erie, Lake Erie pumped every year across the U.S. Okay, and we could assess how much of that pumpage is balanced by storage depletion versus how much is balanced by capture. And in my studies, I came up with an assessment of groundwater depletion over that 108 year period with est included estimates of annual depletion uh, for each year in that period. Uh, and we had, and, and I did my assessment for approximately the 40 largest aquifer systems in the US uh, in which there was some change in groundwater storage. There were some other systems in which uh, we looked at the, there was a negligible change, long-term change in groundwater storage. So uh, I didn't include that. But in terms of overall effects in the U.S., uh, the depletion volume compared to the pumping, uh, it turns out that only about 15%, 1.5% of the groundwater pumpage is balanced by storage depletion in aquifers. And that's, I think, is a little surprising to a lot of people who, th who thought it's probably a much bigger number. But that implies that 85% of the pumpage has to be balanced by capture in one form or another. And that, I think, is surprising uh, to many people, uh, particularly hydrologists who have not been focus on groundwater studies. Uh, there's there's a right. lot of stu a lot of lot of uh, assessments that assume that all or most pumpage is balanced by storage depletion, and that's simply not the case. And I would argue that uh, the numbers that we got for the U.S., which again is is probably reason there's certainly uncertainty there, but it's probably good within plus or minus ten percent, maybe plus or minus fifteen percent. So that 85% that being balanced by capture, I think is a pretty reliable, fairly reliable number. And you could ask, how does that apply to the rest of the world? And I would argue that in terms of sampling, the numbers in the US are reasonably representative of the entire world. In, the, you know, uh, in terms of a sampling issue, the US pumpage is a large fraction of the global pumpage, you know, maybe 20%, something on that order. So, you know, it's a big sample. In the US, we have the full spectrum of climatic conditions. We have the full spectrum of geologic and hydrogeologic conditions for the aquifers, uh, a full range of depth to water or to the water table from very shallow to very deep, uh, and a full spectrum of types of water use. It's really uh, almost a perfect <laughs> example for the entire world in terms of a sampling problem. So I, I would argue those those figures of 15% depletion, 85% capture are a pretty are pretty representative uh, uh, for the, the world as a whole. So, um, Lenny, I just remind the readers that our um, uh, speaker, to our podcast person today is uh, Dr. Lenny Conoco, uh, who's an emeritus professor at the USGS uh, Geological Survey. So, Lenny, I'd like to shift a little bit now to the GRACE satellite data and, um, you know, what it's... Um, uh, the the information we have obtained from it on uh, water storage changes and how that relates to uh, groundwater uh, in the U.S. Uh, uh, and elsewhere. So, um, you know, you and I have been collaborating recently on trying to interpret that. And I just maybe preface it with the GRACE satellites uh, monitor changes in gravity, the Earth's gravity, and uh, the major cause of changes in the Earth's gravity at monthly timescales are changes in water storage. 
uh, total water yeah. storage from the atmosphere to the moho. Uh, and then yeah. we have to figure out how much of that is groundwater. And then I think the value of GRACE also is extremely important for areas where we don't have the wealth of information that we have in the US from monitoring and modeling programs. So maybe you could uh, talk a little bit, and you and um, Bill Alley wrote the paper, Bringing Grace Down to Earth, where you looked at, uh, uh, you know, what Grace can provide, but also the limitations uh, for um, water managers and things like that. Well, uh, Grace is a wonderful tool, and uh, I have every reason to believe that it, it can provide accurate and amazingly precise estimates of changes in gravity. Uh, so as a hydrologic tool, it has to be viewed as one of many tools in our toolbox, and it has to be used uh, with some proper cautions uh, as any other tool. The GRACE satellites uh, started collecting data in the early 2000s. So one immediate limitation is you can't go back before that and make any assessments of long-term changes that may have occurred over the 20th century. Uh, so uh, that's clearly one limitation. Uh, the other uh, major factor is what you had mentioned, uh, one of the major factors to keep in mind is that transfer forming the estimates of, of total water storage changes into groundwater depletion or groundwater storage changes involves some idealizing assumptions and complicated calculations. And it's not that simple. And that introduces uh, you know, some errors. And I've seen published studies where, you know, they've made some gross misstatements and errors about how much groundwater pumpage and ground and the causes of groundwater depletion uh, have occurred in some large areas, uh, not because there's anything wrong with the GRACE data, but because they haven't accounted for uh, other hydrologic processes and factors such as changes in soil moisture over large areas, uh, natural base flow recession during drought periods when the water table naturally declines and base flow discharge will exponentially decrease in time. And you can attribute these changes to groundwater pumpage. So we've seen areas where such mistakes have, have been made. Um, on the other hand, uh, as you know, because you, you've been involved in these studies, We've looked at some systems where the GRACE data or the estimates of groundwater depletion from GRACE data do not agree with very detailed calibrated groundwater model estimates of depletion. In close examination, at least in one well-known case that, that you've published on, shows that the, the GRACE data were more accurate, the interpretations from GRACE data uh, were probably more reliable than the well-calibrated groundwater model. Uh, and uh, the case specifically is the uh, Mississippi Embayment Aquifer, uh, which is a large system. There's a lot of groundwater use. A lot of it is for rice pr uh, production and, and which requires a lot of water. So there's a lot of groundwater pumpage and um, groundwater use really accelerated uh, in the early 1970s uh, as irrigation, particularly for rice, uh, grew. So there was certainly depletion associated with this. Concerns about the aquifer led to the Geological Survey developing a uh, large model of the Mississippi and Bayman aquifer systems. This was published in a professional paper. It indicated a very large volume of groundwater depletion. Uh, I don't remember the number exactly, but it was certainly more than 150, maybe 200 cubic kilometers of uh, groundwater depletion uh, uh, over the long term. This was surprising for an area that's in a, at least a humid or semi-humid climate. And it turns out re-examination by the USGS and by others, uh, 
it was recognized that the original model, and I'm not criticizing the original model really, but they, they did a nice job, but they only included the 40 largest surface water features, rivers, streams in their model. In fact, a closer look, including by the USGS, showed that there are, uh, you know, more than a thousand <laughs> smaller streams and water features uh, that are well connected with the aquifer system. And the great bulk of these were not included or represented in the simulation model. Now, the simulation models are great for numerical accuracy and they perform a perfect mass balance or, you know, with, with an error of less than 0.1% typically in the water mass balance. So the amount of pumpage was specified, that was known. And so the model then has to account for it. And if there's not a possibility of representing the full scope of capture, the model will then assume or balance the pumpage by storage depletion. And so I, you know, I mm -hmm. know they're working on a better model now that that incorporates finer resolution and many, many more surface water features. And I look forward to, you know, seeing the uh, revised USGS model study. But that's an example where uh, GRACE, uh, analysis of GRACE data uh, was, was really a key to demonstrating that uh, a, a down-to-earth model needed improvement. So, so it works both ways. It's a, a great state is a powerful tool. Uh, it could right. be used, it could be misused. Uh, you know, it, it, right. it, it, each yeah. case has to be re-examined. Another factor with uh, the grace data is that it has a pretty large footprint. Uh, it's, it, you know, the scale, a pixel of uh, information, you know, the footprint's on the order of 100,000 square kilometers. You know, with the, the latest satellites, maybe it's a little smaller than that. But many aquifers uh, of concern mm -hmm. that are critical for local, small communities or even large communities, the aquifers are on the order of hundreds to thousands of square kilometers in aerial extent. And the GRACE data provides a big picture. Right. It does not provide any details on what's going on at a scale that the water managers in these smaller systems need in order to uh, better manage uh, their systems. So there is a limitation uh, in that sense, and it's a very uh, big limitation. Uh, Maybe in the future that uh, we'll be able to get much better resolution, but that's still far off into the future. Uh, yeah, but again, I, uh, it, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think they'll be able to get uh, much higher resolution, Lenny, because that's a function of the elevation of the satellite and, right. and there's a lot of atmospheric drag and other things that they have to counter. So it's a, a trade-off between the lifespan of the satellite and uh, the resolution. And, uh, you know, so, yeah. you know, so yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure that they're going to get much higher resolution in the future, but I think that's a good uh, uh, yeah. summary of, you know, the, the linkages then between grace and, and I think it, because it captures people's, because it's so visual what they show with Grace that people, it captures the public's interest and and, and they see uh, these animations and stuff. So things like the uh, uh, Central Valley region and other areas uh, in Dogangetic Basin, you know, they can see it through and, and then decision makers can, uh, and policy makers uh, can seem to get it uh, more readily than what we get from, you know, the detailed analysis. So I think it plays a role uh, in helping with decision makers and, and policy makers, um, you know, move towards more sustainable uh, groundwater management. Um, right. I think right. we're heating Maybe. up against uh, the hour, um, uh, yeah. uh, Lenny. Uh, but, yeah. uh, let, let me add, uh, well, one more thing in terms of, uh, sustainability of groundwater resources and the interaction between uh, surface water and groundwater. There are two just excellent U.S. Geological Survey circulars uh, that are available. One is by Tom Winter and Associates, circular number 1139. 
and uh, Circular 1376 by Barlow and Leak. Uh, these reports are available for free downloading uh, from the USGS websites. And uh, I'll point out on the uh, there are two highly relevant eBooks published by the Groundwater Project. I'm the co-author of one of them uh, that are available for downloading at no cost uh, at the website gw-project.org. So if you go there, you'll find a, a great resource uh, for uh, many, many books and information uh, at no cost. So, uh, yeah. So, so Lenny, uh, you know, we haven't had time to get into the management aspects, but, uh, you know, your understanding of groundwater surface interactions, uh, you know, would parlay into uh, managing these resources conjunctively and then also managed aqua recharge and many other things. But unfortunately, we don't have time uh, to discuss right. it. But um, I really appreciate your taking the time to uh, visit with me today and to describe your work. And uh, I am a huge admirer of your tireless efforts uh, to you. collate so much data uh, from different sources to try to provide an understanding of groundwater systems and to educate all of us um, on the uh, nuances of uh, these things and the implications. So thank you so much, Lenny. And uh, well, th thank you, Bridget, for inviting me. And thank you for hosting this uh, really valuable series of podcasts. Uh, and I look forward to seeing how the series develop and uh, listening to uh, all the other speakers that, that you invite to participate. So thank you very much. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.